Hi. Sit back, relax, and turn on your tell me vision. The Queen's Messenger. This is a great curiosity. Most people do not think of TV going as far back as 1928. It was a crude attempt, but it happened. However, unlike other great innovations, such as Columbus discovering America in 1492, or the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903, this one goes uncelebrated. They won't tell you about the very first TV show in history class. It all started with WGY. WGY was a radio station in Schenectady, New York. It was the 12th such station in America. Radio was barely a thing at this time, and WGY only started in 1922. However, by 1926, they were already thinking about experimenting with television. The invention of television was a long time coming. As a matter of fact, the very word of television was first said in 1900 by a Russian scientist named Konstantin Perskayai. The idea of television had been floating around since at least the 1880s, not too long after movies started being made. But this was something that was easier said than done, and it took many decades and much work to make it a decent form of communication. The idea of television was new and sexy. It was the stuff of science fiction. It's hard to say why people were so gung-ho in seeing this invented and perfected. No one could have anticipated the full impact television would have on the world. Still, it's one of those things that people messed with until they created a monster, like Frankenstein. If we want to generalize things, we can say that TV actually came out in the middle 1920s. There were experiments conducted before the first actual TV show, but The Queen's Messenger is the first time we really knew that something cool could be done with the medium on a wide scale. TV was very experimental for its first three decades of existence. The idea was there, but it was far from perfect. It's amazing that the first actual TV show came out in 1928, when silent movies were still being made. We have General Electric to thank. WGY's original licensee was General Electric, also headquartered in Schenectady. Their original location was a two-room studio on the fourth floor of GE Building 36, although their antenna was on Building 40, about a third of a mile away. GE had been working on developing radio for quite a while. In the 1900s decade, this project was handed off to an electrical engineer by the name of Ernst Alexanderson. There was a lot of trial and error in the development of radio. Too much to get into here. However, in 1922, GE was given its first broadcasting license on February 4th, 1922. They were assigned the random call letters of WGY. A bogus explanation would later be supplied that the W stood for wireless, the G stood for general electric, and the Y stood for the last letter in Schenectady. The station made its first broadcast on February 20th of 1922 at 7.47 p.m. It lasted an hour and consisted mostly of live music. The next broadcast was a few days later and featured a speech about George Washington, followed by a concert. Yeah, early radio was really weird. Nobody knew what they were doing and they didn't have anything to go by. It wouldn't be long though before WGY became popular for its quality programming. There were news programs, live music, and farm bulletins. What really brought them to light were the WGY players. The station had only been around for a few months when the WGY players were formed. Where did they come from? Edward H. Smith was the director of a community theater in nearby Troy, New York called The Mask. Smith suggested to Colin Hager, WGY's first announcer and station manager, that they should carry weekly 40-minute adaptations of plays. Hager agreed, and the WGY players were formed as radio's first dramatic series. This was an immediate hit, and it greatly improved WGY's popularity. Mechanical Television In 1926, 
Ernst Alexanderson began working on an experimental mechanical television system. What is mechanical television? This process actually used a mechanical scanning device that was a motorized camera made to scan the scene and generate the video signal. In this case, the device had a rotating disc with holes in it. Mechanical television wasn't an awesome process by any means, and for reasons we'll get into later, was abandoned by the early 1930s in favor of electronic television. In 1928, GE launched its own television station. It was actually called W2XCW, but was referred to as WGY Television, named after the WGY radio station. The first TV show, but not the first broadcast. The Queen's Messenger is still what we would call the first real TV show, but it wasn't WGY's first broadcast. A few months before, the station released its first news broadcast. It did this three afternoons per week. Why doesn't this count as the first TV show? First of all, it's news. It's not a real show. Second, these broadcasts weren't made for the general public. They were mostly seen by General Electric employees with the intention of refining their equipment. This is the kind of experimentation that would later allow them to do the Queen's Messenger. A small number of hobbyists in America built their own TV sets and watched these news programs on their 3-inch screens. It was said that the shortwave signals, even at that time, could reach Los Angeles. That's pretty impressive for primitive television in 1928. It's believed that one of the first images transmitted by the TV station was of the cartoon character Felix the Cat. Why? Because the character's design was very simplistic and ideal for the low resolution medium. On September 11, 1928, the WGY players put on the first televised play. It was an old spy melodrama called The Queen's Messengers. The stars were Isetta Jewell and Maurice Randall. Isetta Jewell was a star in her day and was quite accomplished as a stage actress, women's rights activist, and politician. Alexanderson had developed a portable and simplified television transmitter that made the broadcast possible. The show was only a one-act drama and ran for 40 minutes. What was it about? The Queen's Messenger was originally written for radio by J. Hartley Manners. It was adapted for this historic TV broadcast. The story is quite simple. A British diplomat has a romantic encounter with a mysterious Russian woman. She is secretly trying to obtain the secret papers he is carrying in his case for the Queen. This particular play was chosen for a practical reason. It had only two performers. Three scanning device cameras could be used, one for each actor and one for the scene props. Who saw it? This show was performed twice, once at 1.30 p.m. and once at 11.30 p.m. The only viewers were newspaper and magazine writers. There were six TVs set up around the city. They were connected by closed circuit television. They watched the program on little TV sets just three miles away. The cameras picked up the stage movement and the microphones collected the sound. It was essentially a live silent movie, but radio provided the sound. What were the TVs like? The screens were tiny, just 3 by 3 inches, and pink in color. The sets themselves were 10 inches high and octagonally shaped. They were 4 inches deep. Television receivers were set up in transmitting control rooms and received the signal from the air. The TV sets did not have sound. The sound part came from a separate radio receiver that was placed under the television receiver. Even further behind the scenes. Three inch screens were incredibly tiny by anyone's standard, even back in 1928. Hey, it was the best they could do. Knowing this, the people who put on the show had to do things to accommodate for the size. Sometimes a figure of the person had to be shown instead of the actual person 
so the character could be better seen. There were special effects in this TV show, although they wouldn't be thought much of as effects today. Really, they were just props. One was a wine glass that had liquid poured into it from a long neck bottle. Wow. Amazing. Other props included watch dials, keys, revolvers, and stacks of documents. Within itself, these things weren't even mind-blowing in 1928. But they were on TV, so they were, like, famous. The stage consisted of three spotlights, three scanning machine cameras, three microphones, background scenes, and other equipment used to set up all these things. Mortimer Stewart, the director, was brought in special from New York City. Mortimer stood between the two cameras that pointed on the two actors. In front of him was a television receiver that he could see at all times. Ideally, this would show the images as they went out over the transmitter. Whether the people watching the show could see the same thing was an uncertainty. Mortimer also had a small control box near him. This allowed him to switch cameras and fade the image in and out. The third camera was specifically for the props. Two assistant actors displayed their hands before this camera when the occasion called for it. The Reception well, there was no such thing as the Nielsen ratings back then. Even at that, only a handful of people saw the show. At the time, this event got a lot of publicity. Still, it would not get the attention or long-lived acclaim of other big news events as Charles Lindbergh and the Spirit of St. Louis from the year before. This TV experiment was more or less considered just dinking around. It was a success for General Electric and the electrical engineer behind it, Ernst Alexanderson. It was not, however, a perfect success. There were notable problems. For one, the process of mechanical television could never produce good enough images to impress the public. The idea for something cool was there, but it wasn't cool yet, so people were like, big deal. The picture flickered throughout the show. It also shifted from left to right on the television screen instead of staying in the center. This was due to the variation in speed of the motor used to drive the scanning disc. In addition, and according to Alexanderson, the play was no great work of art by any means. He went on to say that director Mortimer Stewart annoyed everyone involved when he kept calling for rehearsals at 4 in the morning. It was the general opinion of everyone who watched the broadcast that the day of radio moving pictures was a long, long way in the future. As already mentioned, the picture quality was bad. It was hard to say if television could ever be made useful or commercially successful. If they only knew then what we know now. The underwhelming reception of The Queen's Messenger on both sides of the fence is perhaps the biggest reason why this notable experiment didn't get the full attention it deserved then or now. The Legacy of WGY and the Queen's Messenger WGY television converted to an all-electronic system in the 1930s. It went through two more call signs. Then, in 1942, it received a commercial license as WRGB. As of 2023, this TV station is still in operation. The WGY radio station also still exists, and it's still called WGY. In 1994, it became an all-news and talk station. With the exception of General Electric, everything about this grand TV experiment and the people involved have become great obscurities. True, their finished product was very crude, but you have to appreciate their attempt. And there had to be something people liked about it, or no one would have continued to work on the idea of television. TV has gone way past fun time stuff. It stopped being only entertainment a long time ago. In the decades since The Queen's Messenger, the medium of television has become an indispensable form of communication. It means many things to many people. You can even learn from it. How cool is that? The Queen's Messenger may be a little-known moment in history, 
but its contribution to television, an invention so important to civilization, is giant. You'll be reminded of that every time you watch this episode of Tell Me Vision. <laughs>